Now, Washington Mornings on the Mall. At AM 630. A 37 WMAL, Brian Neiman, Brian Wilson with you. Happy to have Larry Kudlow back on the line, host of the Kudlow Report on CNBC, which you can see every weekday night, 7 o'clock on CNBC. Also, the Larry Kudlow Radio Show, Saturday nights at 7 o'clock here on WMAL. Good morning, Larry. Good morning, good morning. I know you've had Marco Rubio on the show many times before, but uh, the other day on your program, he was talking about a term that you love, and that is economic growth, and that it is the cure to all of our ills. Yes. And so the question is how to get there. Right. The question is how to restore it. I mean... Senator Rubio is, in my opinion, at least a very sound thinker. He's a supply sider. He's a free market guy. He's a pro-growth uh, tax reformer. He's a spending cutter. Uh, he really was, uh, is hoping that the uh, Obamacare uh, mandate is, uh, is taken out by the Supreme Court and something much more free market is substituted in its place. So, yeah, he's a good thinker. And um, I also thought it was interesting when I pressed him, I pretty much got him to agree that he holds a similar position to President Obama regarding the young people who are the sons and daughters of the illegal immigrants mm-hmm. who should not be deported, particularly if they're in school or college or the military, but that you know Obama's um, bypassing of Congress was the real problem. Right. And Obama refused to do any business refused to talk to Rubio, refused to talk to Republicans and reach across the aisle. But the bypassing of Congress was the big problem. On substance, however, Rubio's own version of the DREAM Act uh, would include uh, letting the younger people stay, and I think that's very good. I myself favor that very much. I mean, that border security, of course, is very important, but the fact of the matter is why should these people be penalized for something their parents did, and why shouldn't they get an education? So the it now looks that Thursday is going to be the day we get the big decision from the Supreme Court on Obamacare. And I have read that, that some people believe that a final determination about that may actually be something that will be well received by the business community, especially if the law is struck down. But it seems to me when you look at things like what happened with the Supreme Court ruling on immigration, we're like, likely to get sort of a mixed bag of ruling on this matter, and that will be confusion. How is the market likely to react? Well, I, I don't know. I mean, it depends how specific they are. Let's assume for the moment the mandate is struck down. I, I obviously don't know that, but let's just assume that. Um, I think there will be a sigh of relief from the business community because the taxes and regulations and mandates have been a huge obstacle uh, to business hiring, business investing, business expansion. Uh, Some people, including myself, think Obamacare has really helped create something of a hiring freeze. They just don't know what they're going to do. They don't want to pay the taxes. They probably put a lot of people uh, into the public pool for greater subsidies and greater costs. However, let me caution that even if the mandate is struck down, business and everybody else is not going to know what the substitute, what's going to occur in its place. How will insurance companies, uh, for example, uh, deal with pre-existing conditions, which is a big issue because that was part of the mandate. In other words, I don't know how much of the mandate will be struck down. I don't know what the follow-through is going to be, what kind of new plans will be drawn up by Republicans, what kind of new plans will be drawn up by Democrats. Uh, all these questions are endemic and, frankly, are not likely to be settled anytime soon. So what you, you, you might know on Thursday that the mandate is unconstitutional. You will not, however, know on Thursday what's going to take its place, if anything. And so isn't it true that generally business doesn't like uncertainty? Well, business doesn't like the mandate. <laughs> that's you know, that's first true. and yeah. foremost. Don't forget that. Um, you can't hardly find a uh, businessman or woman that wants this thing. It's extremely, extremely unpopular. But, yes, insofar as the next step in legislation uh, for some kind of health care program, I mean, are you going to have interstate insurance, for example? Nobody's going to know that. Uh, what's the fate of the... Um, of these uh, market exchanges, these so-called market exchanges, on a state-by-state basis. 
uh, how our insurance company is going to react, how our hospital is going to react. We don't know that, and there's a lot of speculation. But, I mean, I don't know. What's Mitt Romney's plan? You tell me. You know, he's opposed to Obamacare. He wants mm-hmm. to end it. He'd end it on day one, et cetera, et cetera. What's his plan? We don't know that yet. Those are kinds of uncertainties that are going to linger. Yeah, he's been quiet about that. He was kind of quiet about Arizona yesterday as well. Mm-hmm. Um, let me ask you about economic growth, though. Can you get economic growth without Europe? Because it doesn't seem like Europe's going to be settled anytime oh, sure soon. sure we could. You th- yeah. So you're not sure worried about having moving forward without Europe? Look, we, we had for, I don't know, 25 years in the 80s and 90s uh, and different times during the 2000s. The U.S. was in the middle of an economic boom and Europe was not. I mean, the gap between growth and productivity between the U.S. and Europe widened substantially uh, in favor of the U.S. If we're pursuing pro-growth policies, if we're pursuing pro-job policies, if we're pursuing capital formation policies, there's no reason why we can't grow this economy, uh, and frankly, at 4, 5, 6%. I mean, the, our exports to Europe, uh, I think if the number is 12 or 13% is our total mm-hmm. exports to Europe. That's all it is. Our biggest trading partners are uh, Canada and Mexico and increasingly parts of Asia. So Europe is not that important. In in a worst-case scenario, if Europe implodes, and I mean implodes with banking contagion and and the rest, it would take about a half a point off U.S. GDP. That's all. And we could make that up uh, elsewhere in the GDP if we have pro-growth policy. So, no, I don't. I've never bought into the fact that Europe is holding us hostage in terms of our growth and jobs. Never, never, never. On that front, you had uh, the president of the Dallas Federal Reserve on. I forget his name. Right, Richard Fisher. Richard Fisher. And he he said things are better than what people say they are. His point, I think, was we we can't talk ourselves into a double-dip recession. Well, I I think, yeah, I mean, he was telling me to be cautionary, but, you know, look, we've had several months now of, of... almost uninterrupted in, in bad numbers. I mean, the jobs numbers are slowing and slowing. Uh, retail sales falling for a couple of months. Factory orders falling for a couple of months. Manufacturing falling for a couple of months. So my question to Richard Fisher is, uh, is your assessment of the economy correct? In other words, he's against extra stimulus. He doesn't want uh, QE3, for mm-hmm. example. Okay, fine. I actually think he has an important point because I don't think that stuff works, and I think the economy has plenty of Fed money, Fed liquidity. But if the economy is slipping back into some kind of recession or it's on the tip of a recession, what to do? I think that Richard Fisher would say it's a fiscal problem, it's a tax problem, it's a regulatory problem, it's a spending problem, and I happen to agree with that. But uh, my assessment of the economy right now has colored me very worried. I just don't like all these data points coming out uh, that show that we, you know, we're probably less than 2% GDP growth right now. And that is not a satisfactory condition, not only because it's a lousy number historically, but look, if you had an inventory correction, uh, and you've got some deflation of commodity prices going on, that could drive GDP into negative territory. It wouldn't be hard at all. So uh, I, I don't know what Dick Fisher, I'm, I'm not sure he totally disagrees with me. Uh, he was just trying to play it a right. little bit from the optimistic side. Right. Thank you, Larry. As always, we appreciate it.